got down to about four seconds prior to liftoff, when the main engines began to throttle up to 100%, all of a sudden, the vibration set in like I've never seen before. The countdown continued, three, two, one, a T minus zero. I got a boot like I've never felt. And the vibration simply shook every nut and bolt in the whole place. And that 400, four million pound vehicle literally lurched, leaped off of the launch pad. And we were on our way. Lake City in the 1950s, it was a small agricultural town embedded in the heart of South Carolina. Work was hard, comforts were few, black was black, and white was white. Segregation of races was a part of life back then. These were humble beginnings for a man who would reach for the stars. I'm Jim McGee. And I'm Vanessa Hill. This evening, we'd like to take a close look at the life of a man who recently we've all become acquainted with. The life of Dr. Ronald E. McNair ended tragically and abruptly on January 28, 1986. The explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger was a national tragedy. The unthinkable had happened. And in our mourning, we shed real tears for the loss of such talented and promising lives and the loss of our own native son. Dr. Ronald McNair died a national hero, but his heroism is not found in his death, it's found in his spirit. A spirit that broke the barriers of poverty and ignorance. Tonight we are proud to take a look at the life of Dr. Ronald McNair. The road between South Carolina and spaceflight is not a very simple one. Twenty years ago, um, Lake City was, I would say, just like um, everyday town in South Carolina your blacks and your whites had a relationship, but it wasn't one that went over into the social aspect of life. But even 20 years ago, people were close. Ronald came up in a Lake City at that time that was not backwards, but not really updated at that time. Whatever anybody in Lake City got at that time, it was a struggle. Ron, like all of us used to do, crop tobacco, other menial um, farm work. He used to tease and say he was the best tobacco cropper in Florence County. Basically, I met him during the time of working in the field. We used to pick cotton sometime together and crop tobacco. I think it was my eighth grade year going into high school. I really got a chance to know him. One day I missed the bus and I walked down Moore Street, that's where McNair lived in. There was an old basketball hoop. We used to play in the back of an old building, old church building. Couldn't afford a basketball goal. We had an old bicycle rim, you know, with all the spokes out, we nailed it up beside the building, and that's where we would play ball. Someone said the other day, and something I'm quote, quoting from what Ronald said, that someone asked him, uh, what kind of family did you come from? And he says, I came from a very high upper class family, but we just had a very low income. Because I'm reminding of a time um, when they were living over here on Moore Street next to a church that used to be his grandfather's church and we were visiting there and the house was spotless and we said to Pearl you know how nice and clean everything is how do you keep your house so clean and working she says my boys do this for me and while we were talking um Ronald came in I don't know whether Pearl even remember this or not but he came in and said um is it anything that I can do for you before I leave and she said no said everything is all right you just go on and I'm thinking that the boy was going someplace to play and he went into the back bedroom to do whatever he would do and we said to Pearl so what are you saying that you know Ronald did all of this he keeps the house clean she said yeah my boys do all the things for me so we may not have the best things in the world 
we sure keep them the cleanest things in the world. Yes, they were rich uh, as a family. Uh, they were, uh, they, they were, there was constant togetherness with them. They traveled together. They did things together. And uh, that's richness that uh, some people never have, that, uh, that have a lot more money than, than uh, that he or I or, or most people would have. That there's a richness that, uh, that you, and, and that can, kind of richness can't be taken away. You remember when he was born? Yeah. Tell me about it. What do you remember? Well, there's nothing special. Just another little black baby born in Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> nothing special. <laughs> I knew his mother and his father before he was born. So I, I remember him when he was remember when he was born. There's nothing special. Lake City used to be a, a little, like, well, like most southern towns, you know. Uh, he had to come to overcome a lot of things that normally a child shouldn't have to overcome. And I was so proud for him because, like I said, he came from real humble beginnings. But he was proud. He knew where he wanted to go. Those who knew Ronald McNair knew there was something extra special about him. He had a thriving thirst for knowledge, a curiosity that led him to expand his horizons and interests. He established himself as a strong student, a strong competitor on the athletic field, and a budding musician. Ron McNair pushed himself to be the best that he could be. He loved life and enjoyed people, always encouraging them and challenging them. The spirit of Ronald McNair couldn't be kept to himself. It spilled out of him and poured onto everyone who knew him. You may not come from the most well-to-do financial background. You may not come from the most affluent social background. You may not have glided through the University of South Carolina with the greatest of ease. But if you're willing to work hard, sacrifice, and struggle, then I proclaim today, you are better than enough. Ron was one grade behind me, but he took classes on our level because he was advanced above his class. So he was like younger, but yet he was within our academic setting and, you know, really was an aggressive person. But Ron was a perfect student in just about everything. So Ron got A's in just about everything. I got A's in chemistry and biology and B's and C's and English and history and things of that nature. But he could do it all. He could do it all. He wasn't 100% good, as good, you know, what I mean, uh, all the time. He did his little boy's devilish things. Because <laughs> I remember one time the principal gave him something to learn. He didn't learn it any time the principal um, thought he should have learned it. And the principal grabbed him on the hall and shipped him up and said, if you're going to be a dunce, be a dunce. If you're going to be a brilliant someone, be a brilliant someone. And he said from then on he just, he knew he had it. He just was going to use it after he had it since that. That kind of shook him up. No, he wasn't, he wasn't an angel now. But he was a very remarkable young man. I remember one day in class, we were going along, I thought, at a moderate rate of speed, and he held his hand up. He said, Mr. Cooper, when are we going to get down to business? He said, we're going too slow. Caught me by surprise. I think most of the other kids thought that we were going at least fast enough. Uh, his classmate, Vila McClam, tells a story once she remembered him telling her. When he was in ninth grade or nine years old, he wanted to check out a book of calculus from the Lake City Public Library. And they wouldn't do it because he was a little black boy. So he went downtown to a white druggist, a Jew, and then Marshall Hyden. I know Marshall Hyden, too. And Marshall Hyden checked the book out for him. Isn't that something? Ninth grade, he wanted a book on calculus. I noticed that with this young man, there was uh, a little bit more of a curiosity among science items, and I figured that with calculus book, it may be just be a, a word to him. Maybe later on, he'd uh, he really understand what he was uh, getting into. So I uh, made a point to get the book for him, so that he could uh, be more acquainted with uh, other things in life besides just the regular course that are taught in school. Well, Ronald's, Ronald's first uh, love to me was uh, music. He loved music. That was my first love, incidentally. I taught him band also, as you know. He came here in seventh grade and 
Uh, we didn't have a lot of instruments at that time. Uh, he wanted to play, and he had another brother in the same grade as he. I think they were able to get one instrument, but they felt that it was difficult to get a second instrument. And he wanted to play very badly, so I went and over to Strains of Music. This was before your time, so I know you wouldn't know about it. They had a Strains of Music over in Florence. I went over and they had some old instruments. And we bought an old, and he called it old, old saxophone. All of the lacquer had gone off of it. We had to kind of put rubber bands on it to make the keys work. But I brought it and I gave it to Ron. and. He was as proud as if it had been a brand new shiny instrument. Gave it to him in September and when it came time for Christmas parades, he was playing well enough that I put him in the marching band. He caught on very fast. In fact, uh, he played saxophone. I think that was his first love, but I had need of a clarinet player. So I asked him, said, Ron, why don't you play clarinet for me? And he agreed to do it put him on clarinet and he was, he turned out to be my best clarinet player also. Had he chosen to, he could have become a very good professional even uh, musician. Well, he could play a saxophone well enough to play with Count, with Duke and the Count Basie, just that well. Ron was physically stronger than myself. I always knew that and mentally more, more alert. On the football field, Ron um, was a very talented runner, very strong. I used to play center, as I said, and he played in the backfield. I can remember a couple of times him running up my back because I could not move the man out of my way in front of me. And he was, on several occasions, I was trampled by Ron and a few other bigger guys. I remember, now he wasn't all angel, he was a normal boy growing up. When he graduated in 1967, he, they went up on the water tower and painted class of 1967 up there, and his mother fussed at him a lot about that, going that high up in the air, you know, with no, nothing under him. Under him. Um, he used to do real simple thing. We put a couple of tacks in uh, our uh, biology teacher seat, Mr. Johnson. Roy Johnson. Well, I remember one case uh, we were doing in a uh, dissect on a frog. We had to destroy the medulla in the frog and allow his heart to be beating after we cut him open and have to wait until the instructor come by and inspect us and this half the heart frog had to be perfectly paralyzed. Mr. Johnson was walking around looking at all the frogs and Ron and myself was on one side of the classroom and I had a tack in my hand and I wanted to put it in his seat. So I put the tack in the seat and, and I guess he figured that was too obvious so what he did was just slip a sheet of paper over the tack. <laughs> so uh, he sat on the tack and learned our phrase and got blamed for it. He played a lot of sports. Uh, but a lot, he was he excelled at football. But Ronald, I mean, his best sport was um, baseball. He loved baseball. He was the catcher for the street team. Each one of the streets in the neighborhood had a team. He lived on Moore Street, and the name of that team was the Moore Street Giants. He was the catcher, and quite naturally, your catcher is the person that controls the entire team. He said, and this was at the time of Sputnik. You know, someday I, I, I would like to go into space. Of course, we didn't take it seriously at that time. But uh, knowing him, the caliber of student he was, and that presented a challenge to him, and, and that's what he always wanted. Anything that was challenging, that was what he wanted to do. Like Mr. Cooper saying that when Sputnik went up, he said he was going up. And one of his teachers, Irene Jones, said that she could remember him laying out on the yard on his back, looking up into the skies and dreaming about making plans to one day go up there. He seemed always happy. The way you see him on those pictures, smiling, 
that's the way I've always seen him. And when he was around, you felt happy. I felt young when he was around, you know, when he come around. He was full of life, vim, big, and vitality. And we were talking about how many years it was going to take us to get the Nobel Prize. And I told him by 1988 I should have the Nobel Prize. And he said he didn't think it would take him that long to get the way he had to uh, go. He was the kind of student you don't meet that many. You meet about one or, one or two in your lifetime. In 1967, Ronald McNair graduated valedictorian of the Old Carver High School in Lake City. His achievements there didn't go unnoticed. He was offered two scholarships, one in athletics, the other in science. Ronald refused the athletic scholarship and embraced the challenges that awaited him at North Carolina A&T. Although Ronald was a superior athlete, he believed science offered him a more rewarding and exciting future. Soon after arriving on the campus of North Carolina A&T, he was confronted with feelings of self-doubt, wondering if he was good enough. I can still hear the voice of my goddess counselor saying, get up and fight because you're good enough. He turned down a an athletic scholarship, for instance, to Howard University because he thought that uh, his future would be much better in an uh, area other than, than athletics. Um, so he did have physics in mind. However, during his first week he, here, uh, he heard all sorts of stories about how difficult physics was and uh, how he would flunk out for sure and all this sort of thing. and and. Um, you know, we can't think of Ron McNair as being uh, anything other than human. This began to work on him, and he began to worry about whether he could really should become a physics major. And he thought, well, I'm very good at music. Uh, maybe a music major is what I really need to be. And so he went over to the counseling area and talked to a counselor over there. And uh, the counselor, evidently after tests and this sort of thing, told him that he had the ability and he had the potential to be a major in physics and that she thought that he should go on and be what he could be. He um, seems to have it all together, doesn't he? Um, he was, it seems like everything he tried, he did very well. But I don't think it was effortless. Um, I know his physics wasn't effortless. I know that he had to work at it. And if he didn't work at it, uh, he didn't get the grades. And so he did. He worked hard. Well, he was not happy with bad grades. Uh, I, I know that. He was just a very well-balanced individual. That was, it was amazing. That was one of the reasons why um, I didn't hesitate in suggesting that he could go from A and T uh, up to MIT. Uh, MIT being well known as a real pressure cooker type of atmosphere for graduate studies that I thought that he could stand the stress and uh, that he could not only survive but he could thrive in an atmosphere like that. And he did. I know he worked hard on his karate and became the karate champion that he became. But he noticed that even when he was here on the karate, for instance, he did not keep that to himself. He became the student coach of the karate team while he was here. Um, he progressed rapidly and successfully in the area and then immediately began to try to pass on his expertise to others. I um, had a ex-student call me up um, and say, I think one of the astronauts that has been selected is Ron McNair. And I, and I so I called the local television station. I said, do you have the names? And they said, yes. And they said one of the names was Ron McNair. And I said, wow. And I went and I called everybody I could think of calling. And uh, I was so excited. My wife said that uh, she's never seen me so excited. I, I, my feet didn't touch the floor for the next week. I was just walking on air. It was, it was really a, a tremendously exciting moment for us. It um, really began 
with Ron's acceptance into the space shuttle program, <coughs> uh, when he got accepted, uh, we started thinking about what we could do here to join him. And then in many conversations that we had with him, he, he really challenged us to join up with him and put a payload on board the space shuttle. We then placed in 1979, June of 1979, uh, placed a reservation with NASA to fly one of their getaway special payloads on board the shuttle. And uh, we've been working on that ever since that time. And uh, Ron has come back many, many times okay, uh, to interface with myself and especially with the students. They were, of course, awed. Hmm? And you're not even sure if you got to brush up against him because there's something special there. there was, and then after he started talking, and they got a chance to have some good verbal interchanges with him, they found that, that he was really just a person just like them. And he, of course, always tried to make that point, that he was no different than anybody else. If anything, he just worked a little bit harder and had some real strong goals that he went after. He really represented the all-around developed person Well, McNair graduated magna cum laude from North Carolina A&T. From there, he went on to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he received a doctorate in physics. Now, we could spend the remainder of our time talking about the achievements of Dr. McNair. There are many. But instead, we'd like to return to his hometown of Lake City. Ron McNair held his hometown close to his heart. It was there that his morals and values were formed. The spirit of Ron McNair originated there, and he talked about Lake City frequently. He was proud of that small, sleepy town, and you can bet that small, sleepy town is proud of him. To go around the world 128 times, 17,500 miles per hour. Aboard the Rolls Royce of space flight is one experience, but to come home amidst warmth and appreciation is an experience of equal magnitude. I shall eternally be grateful for this recognition. And I think Ron loved Lake City. He loved Lake City. Uh, you can't help but love where you came from regardless of how you used to be treated by anybody you can't help but love where you came from ron really loved lake city i think lake city loved ron now he would come back and he would look me up and um, sometimes he would call home i remember one day i was out with the band and when i got home about 11 o'clock at night my daughter said ron McNair called you i was surprised i said is he is he home i didn't know he was home she said, no, I don't think it was from home. He had called me from Houston. Uh, just wanted to talk. So uh, I felt that we had a real close relationship. He would, when you go into the house, there were books on the floor. He was playing his saxophone, and there were other friends there that were playing other instruments. And all of a sudden, here, let's have some pancakes. He was just that kind of person. It, it doesn't matter. It did not have to be morning time for pancakes. There was about maybe a house full of about 10 of us. And all of a sudden, he'd make the batter for the pancakes or waffles. I mean, you know, you have the batter there, and you can make the pancakes or waffle. And I mean, he would just make, starting from nine or ten so everybody could have one and then the stack would begin to accumulate and he was just you know fantastic at everything even cooking um, dinner lunch he just had that extra touch about himself uh, as a child uh, coming up as a boy I remembered once he said that uh, how they almost put a radio station out of business because uh, the telephone quiz he would dial all of the numbers except the last one and when this is called now he would be able to just dial that, that last number and be the first one to get to call and they studied their uh, history and geography whatever and they were ready with the answers and he would have his two brothers over at his mother's house and his grandmother house and he would be at another telephone and they all would do it and they would make sure that they were the first ones to call in to the local radio station here right in lake city my children, my personal children, they tell me, said, uh, I, I believe you thought more of Ron McNair than you do us. Said, you always talk about him. And this was long before he became an astronaut. 
Uh, he was a topic of discussion at my house. Well, the reason I feel that he had a strong belief in God is that uh, he would often mention the times that he attended church and uh, he grew up literally in the church, in this particular church. He grew up in this church and he uh, attended the Sunday schools and with his grandfather, he always tried to stick with his grandfather, Mr. Montgomery. Well, he was a very uh, Christian individual and it's uh, Sometimes it's hard to figure out a person that is in science how that you know how they can be a spiritual person also because they have a different concept that is a creation over against uh, evolution. When he came to church, he was a worshiper. He came uh, to join in the worship, not necessarily to make any speech or to make any kind of impression on anyone, but just as a worshiper. I would say that he was very religious. He couldn't help but be because of his family and his upbringing, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, and the mother, and all of the family around him. They were all what we call um, backbones of our church. He spent a lot of time with his inner self. Um, I think that was his own means of communicating with his maker. Knowing Ronald McNair, he was a person that he, has, he had never forgotten from whence he came. He said that he enjoyed the trip. This is when we had the uh, celebration in honor of Ronald McNair when he came back after the first space flight. He said that he enjoyed the trip and he talked about how he took his saxophone and how he blew the saxophone around the world. And uh, he said the best part of the trip was coming home. I think he's a role model for a lot of our kids. I don't think you'll ever find anybody, I don't think you'll find anybody around Lakes who knows anything derogatory to say about Ronald, because I've never heard anything derogatory about Ronald McNair. And after a street here, the main street was named after Ronald McNair, he says, uh, I never thought that this would happen. Maybe a footpath, but not the main street being named Ronald McNair Boulevard. But he was very pleased by it that uh, he traveled all over the country telling people how this major thoroughfare in his own, own hometown was named after him. He felt that he was indebted or owed to the state here to come back and bring some of his talents and resources here, especially for the young. I think everybody is as proud of him as I am. And I'm really proud. I'm glad I knew him, glad I touched his life, I'm glad I had the opportunity to touch his life whatever that means. McNair was born October 21st, 1950, one of three sons. He died at the age of 35. And in that short span of time, he lived a lifetime. He loved life. He accomplished so much, we can't help but wonder what another 35 years would have brought forth from this man. Is there a lesson to be learned from the life of Dr. Ronald McNair? He claimed to be no different from you or me, only that he tried harder. And if that statement's true, then we must conclude that the biggest obstacle in our own lives is ourselves. The true courage of spaceflight is not striping into one's seat prior to liftoff. The true courage comes in enduring, and as Colonel Bowler said, persevering the preparation. Ron believe, I think, if I can do it, you can do it. Ron, like I said, I don't think Ron realized all of us wasn't as gifted in Italy as he was, but he thought we were. Uh, he taught us, if Ron can do it, you can do it. That's what Ron really believed that. He thought there were a lot of the Ron McNair running around out there. <laughs> I'm glad he wasn't a basketball player or a singer or something. He did it in the educational field, you know. The competition really counts. He was an uh, uh, excellent scientist and he was uh, well, obviously a leader and he was a person who saw his responsibility to youth very strongly. His message was that you need to take some risks, that you need to not just stay on the smooth plane of past successes, but to move out towards the edge, to the abyss of the unknown, and then not 
just timidly peer over the edge, but as he said in one speech, to hang over the edge. I have never seen Ronald McNair in a depressed mood. He always had something to say about, you know, uh, encouraging young folks, and uh, he never just put anyone aside. If he wanted to talk to him, he would always make himself available to talk to someone, uh, to encourage someone along, and to try and uplift someone's spirit. He did that frequently. He was really quite a loving guy. No one could not have loved him. And um, I'm going to miss him, and I really don't think of him actually as gone because he's still with me. But Ronald had great plans for the world. I think he was just shifting in a second gear, in a five gear system. The thing that he's really meant uh, to myself and most importantly to the students is, um, I'd have to say, is to really to dream the impossible, okay? And then to, to develop one's mind and one's body, because he did both, his mind and his body, okay, in the true, you know, Greek sense, uh, develop your mind and body fully then to go after that dream and turn that dream into a reality. We are trying to reinforce the educational process by referring to him from time to time that it's not where you came from, but it's where you set your sights and where you want to go. I didn't get out of class till one o'clock and I came down to the lunchroom as I usually do and walked in. I was in a very good mood. Walked in and the other teachers seemed to have had their heads held and everything was kind of quiet. I walked in and said, well, what's going on in here? It's kind of like a mug. Uh, one of the white teachers said, he must not have heard. Miss Graham, do you, you want to tell him or you want me to tell him? Miss Graham told me what had happened and for one of the few times in my life, I was speechless. I just had to get up and walk out. Uh, Ronald's effect on this community is going to be very powerful. Because, like me, most people that really knew Ronald don't see Ronald as being dead. You know, he's away. But keep thinking he's going to come back, even though we know that he's not going to come back. But that spirit of Ronald is going to be so powerful in Lake City that it's going to have a tremendous impact on the community as a whole. It's going to have a tremendous impact on the educational system in District 3. Something's already in the making. He said doing the entire blast off. First takeoff, he would pray from the time it first ignite until it really smoothed off. And I felt very comfortable about one thing was that if uh, if he uh, if such was the case, and I know he was a strong in the vision. I know he didn't lie. If he, uh, if during that time when this occurred, he must have been praying. And I said, if there's truly one man in heaven, Ron Fieldniff is in heaven. And I, and I believe that with all my heart. Not in my lifetime. I don't think I'll ever see another Ron McNair, another Martin Luther King in my lifetime. They, are, they might be out there, but I don't think I'll ever see them. I myself will be a better person to ensure that I can someday reunite myself with my best buddy I've ever had in my life. You know, be it is in heaven, and I feel to think that's where he must be. And if the world have lost a great man, the Omega, South African, they've lost a great individual, and I doubt very seriously if I ever find another friend like that again, as long as I live.
We'd like to thank you for tuning in this evening. It is our hope the spirit of Dr. Ronald McNair will live on, especially in the hearts of our children. There's been one omission in this presentation. Due to the recentness of the shuttle tragedy and conflicts in scheduling, we were unable to obtain on-camera interviews with members of the immediate family. We would, however, like to thank Ron McNair's mother, Pearl, his brother, Carl, and his wife, Cheryl, for their support of our presentation. We wish them God's blessings. I'm Vanessa Hill. And I'm Jim McGee. Good night. So I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore as far as he can, as deep as he can, into the unknown.